Dobro jutro, dobar dan, moje ime je Saša Solović i zadovoljstvo mi je da budem sportator današnjeg webinara i da budem koristiti ovu disciplinu što se učinjenja i da budem učinjenja i da budem učinjenja. Before we out officially, just a few notes, uh, interpretation option is uh, you can find on the bottom of the screen if you click on the earth, the technical support will be provided by my colleagues uh, Bora, Johanna and Leila. If you have any problems with Zoom application, they will also help me with the questions received to the chat box and at the same time we will have a live streaming on our Facebook channel. If you have any problems, you can follow us on the Facebook. Just a very short technical introduction. We have a translation available. Uh, please choose between English and BHS channel in order to understand us. Uh, technical support will be given by my three colleagues, Bora, Johanna, and Leila. We do also have a live streaming on Facebook in case, in, came, in case that something is really not functioning with the Zoom app. And please post your question in Q&A sessions. My colleague will help me uh, in answering them. Uh, sada možemo da nastavimo zvanično otvaranje. Uh, moje ime je Saša Solović, ja sam menadžer uh, projekta... Uh, my name is Saša Solović and I am a project manager in the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, today and today I will facilitate this webinar, Foresight and how we use this discipline for sustainable transition in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This webinar takes place uh, within the project uh, Sustainable Transition in Bosnia and Herzegovina, BIA. Sutra, funded by the Swedish Embassy in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And this is a follow up on the webinar of the 28th of May, where we analyze megatrends. If you missed it, uh, you can uh, access the recordings thereof on our website. I warmly welcome all our participants. I see that we have uh, participants from different countries of Europe and uh, overseas. And um, I invite you to participate actively in our webinar and to discuss with us these uh, topics, how these fundamental changes take place in our societies, what can we predict, foresee, and how can we shape our desired futures and what challenges we are facing on this path. Now I will share my presentation. Just uh, to present the agenda, we will stick to the agenda which uh, was announced uh, in the process of registration. We have three interesting sessions. We will discuss the, the issue of sustainable transitions, the tools which we can use uh, for foresight uh, um, exercise, uh, and what are the challenges and uh, careers in their application. We have interesting presenters my, two, my, of my colleagues uh, from SEI and two panelists who will join us uh, in the third session. Now let's uh, start uh, with the first session where we will briefly present uh, the concept of sustainable transition in the context of uh, climate policy, uh, policies, environmental policies. Uh, we mentioned uh, a variety of transitions, just transition, energy transition, and these are the concepts uh, that overlap how we came up with this concept historically and on a practical level what we can see is that uh, sectoral policies are available they help us a lot but we need to explore in depth how we can transform our society and uh, towards sustainability and the carbon neutral economies. My question 
for the participants through the Menti application. What is your first association when you hear the concept sustainable transition? Say the word or words, uh, we scan the QR code or open in the browser and uh, enter the code from the slide and uh, tell us what are the words that associate that you relate with the sustainable transition and we will give you a minute or two green green is the, the most uh, frequent answer environment ecology the issue of uh, justice and equality, transformation, changes. No fossil fuel policies. Sustainable. Just. Give uh, other 30 seconds for, for the answers, but uh, justice, equity, justice, green, dominate the answers provided. Investments also. Environment, participation, sustainability. Sustainability. Very well. I would kindly ask my colleague to make a screenshot. Uh, so to keep the conclusions, water, equity, justice, green, clean transformation. This is uh, in line with the definitions of uh, sustainable transitions. There are several definitions, but we picked two most interesting. This is the appearance of a new uh, political discourse, which indicates that it is necessary to uh, recognize that uh, sustainability goals cannot be uh, achieved through technical adjustments. They require a fundamental transformation of social systems, systemic change in, in uh, non-sustainable systems of production and consumption. This requires a fundamental transformation of major social technical systems, including changes in technologies, infrastructure, legislation, market, and behavior. This uh, Overarching change must be a fundamental, multidimensional, and when we say fundamental, this means that the system indeed, indeed needs to change fundamentally. When we say multidimensional, it's not only technology. We should take into account organizational, institutional, uh, political, socio-economical, and economical exit. And this is perhaps the first time that we plan for the next 30 to 50 years. And uh, this is uh, a long period, but it is only one generation. And if we put into context that we, this, we are the only last generation that recalls the time when we lived uh, without internet, without social networks, it is not such a long time because a lot can change during this period. When we say the social technical, socio-technical system, we uh, think of uh, major systems that uh, um, meet our needs, such as uh, food, uh, water, and when we say socio technical system. This is where we recognize and give importance uh, to the technology as an important part of this system. And uh, so technological changes are also very important uh, on the path to sustainable transition. But we need to take into account that there is a strong link between this 
uh, society and technology. We have people, culture of behavior, certain objectives, processes, and infrastructure. We, uh, how the changes in this system take place uh, uh, will be seen by Marcus later on. But uh, the recognition and taking into account that technology is not the only factor is important because then we come up with a very complex network with uh, multiple interactions, uh, both positive and negative, which we need to analyze and which we need to influence. Uh, sustainable transitions. Uh, we are looking uh, at uh, uh, the ecology, economy, they, uh, they are interrelated, and uh, we need policies uh, to uh, come up with a solution. The powers are also important, we has sufficient power to have his or her words, voice heard. What are the, um, uh, the uh, alliances uh, that we need? They are, uh, changes are complex, long-term, and uncertain, and they are highly dependent on the context. Uh, we, perhaps we can find inspiration in different regions when we plan something, but uh, the point is that we need to keep the translation within the framework of our context, our circumstances, and uh, to recognize what are our powers and what are the advantages that we can use in this process. Uh, we need uh, roadmaps, uh, pathways uh, to know how are we going to achieve uh, what we planned. We don't need to focus only on technology. It is uh, highly important, but all other aspects of the system will help us to, to come to that. When we say roadmap, uh, recently, Marcus uh, and myself uh, joked that we are thinking of a highway or a good road through the forest, but uh, that's the road that we need to construct ourselves. Uh, and uh, this uh, picture shows that this will not be easy, but first steps uh, uh, we need to take uh, first steps on our own in this landscape. The transition, different transition phases, uh, they include uh, development of these technologies, innovations, developing solutions for certain problems, and these solutions uh, need to uh, be integrated in our daily life, but at the same time, we need to focus on activities which uh, should uh, reduce the unsustainable aspects. Uh, and the uh, ideal phase uh, is uh, when this will become the institutional part of the new system, that it, it will be a pattern or habit which we will use naturally. This is an illustration from a scientific paper which shows uh, an example of the socio-technical dynamics uh, in the transport sector. We can, it is fair to say that uh, we are in this uh, medium layer called regime, and this is where we see the link uh, which is strong uh, and stable, and we need to analyze thoroughly what are the moments and where is the possibility to affect this system in order to be sustainable. The innovations when, which uh, evolve definitely help us in doing so, but there is the upper layer. Uh, we see a lot of things that affect us, but uh, we uh, cannot control. There is a, a, a fast uh, development of technologies uh, and some other factors that uh, pressure that pressure on us to change the current system where everything happens. If we look back uh, in the recent past, uh, the um, effects of geopolitical policy we, and the pandemic, we see how things can change fast. So we need to be flexible and ready to adapt to new realities. Did we have transitions before? Yes we did, and uh, 
the system of transport uh, used to be horses and coach, but then uh, we had different uh, 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 vehicles propelled by different fuels and uh, collective uh, uh, transportation. This is what we can analyze and see what were the milestones uh, which enabled the innovation to become the part of our daily life. The policies for sustainable transition are important and they need to be a mix of policies that will support the innovation, new technologies, new instruments, and on the other hand, uh, will support the phasing out of uh, those uh, unsustainable things. Redko kad će samo jedna određena politika tome doprineti ili spasiti stvar, treba da razmišljamo o jednom vijabilnom miksu različitih politika. Kada pričamo o državim tranzicijama, ne možemo i da ne kažemo da tu postoji dosta izazova, da treba da se pitamo da li otvaramo nove probleme. There are a lot of problems that we are opening when we speak about sustainable transition. For example, when we speak about the transportation sector, do we have a problem of uh, electrical cars and uh, new uh, kind uh, of issues there? Uh, also, when we calculate emissions of the CO2, are we forgetting about other aspects of uh, sustainability and what kind of compromises can we make? And is everyone happy with these kind of compromises? And uh, how do we look into the general macro perspective and uh, its uh, alignment with uh, our perspectives, our local perspectives? So, in essence, strategies uh, and policies are very important and it is very important to have multi-level governance uh, to have the connection uh, among all actors that will contribute in their capacity to the decision-making processes i'm not speaking only about vertical cooperation but uh, i'm also speaking about involving other actors in decision-making processes such as the professional organizations, NGOs, private sector, that is extremely important for addressing these issues. Uh, another issue is how to support innovations, so how to gradually introduce new technologies, how to deal away with the non-sustainable processes, how to have it in parallel and as smooth as possible. Uh, sustainable transitions are very uh, uh, specific for the context and they have to be just. We will always have winners and losers in the transition, but we have to think about the support support that we can provide, not uh, only in terms of uh, support that can be pr provided, but also to see how a transition can become a new positive force that will drag a region into developing something new. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Now I will pass uh, the right to manage the slides to my colleague Marcus, and he is going to speak in more details about some of the issues that I've mentioned, and uh, he is going to focus on the way in which changes are taking place in this uh, big and uh, rigid a system. Uh, Marcus is uh, my colleague from the SEI, and he's also a uh, associate professor, and he's been dealing with these issues for more than 30 years, uh, namely about connection between science, policy, and practice. Marcus, please. Great. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, it's a treat to be here uh, and to be talking about how we once we figured out what we need to do to figure out how to get there. So uh, as Sasha said, I'm a social scientist, associate professor of sociology, senior fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute. I've worked in research for the past 20 years. And Sasha's making a little younger than I am. Before starting the research career, I spent a couple of decades 
working on legislative issues, grassroots organizing, mobilizing support to get both uh, behavioral change, but also institutional change, changes in laws and programs, et cetera. So my role here is to discuss how we can think about that change once we've figured out what it is we want to accomplish. And uh, a little bit, what are the dials and levers that we need to engage with in order to move things along? I'll come back to some of Sasha's key points, but I, I should just note that sometimes the immediate goals that we set are chosen based on, or best chosen, based on what you think you can actually win on in the shorter run. Uh, and that then opens up new possibilities for later on. And that's, I think, an important point to, to keep in mind. So it's quite common in discussions of change to use the roadmap metaphor. Here we have a real road or an image of a road, not a map, but the uh, EU seems especially fond of roadmaps. Uh, I find this metaphor a little bit problematic and there are several reasons for that. One is, as Sasha mentioned, in most cases, we actually haven't built the roads yet. Uh, even if the roads, similar roads have been built in other places using the same techniques, we still have to prepare the way and build our own roads. And that means it's a very dynamic and often unpredictable process when we're trying to facilitate or steer change. Um, the other thing that this roadmap metaphor doesn't really account for is that sometimes there are roadblocks set up by people who don't want you to reach your destination or organizations of that sort. And so it doesn't really take into account the fact that not everybody has the same destination in mind. They don't trigger your goals. There may be social struggles, or typically there are some kinds of social struggles where people have to leave behind old routines that they're comfortable with and move on to new, new ones. And that plays in in very important ways into a change process. So I, I think the chessboard is a more useful metaphor. Uh, first and foremost, you have an opponent. Uh, and if you're thinking in terms of the pieces on the board, you have many opponents to manage, uh, but also many allies. So the challenges and opportunities shift over the course of the match. So it's, it's a very dynamic process. A uh, series of moves can position you for the next series of moves. And that's very true in, in general change processes. But there are also some elements that are already defined. For example, the board itself creates a structure each of the pieces have distinct roles to play, uh, defined patterns of movement. And the real art of chess is to play your pieces together as a whole in order to move, uh, to move things forward. Your opponent may be no more than routines that people are accustomed to, or it might be actors out there who are, uh, see themselves as being disadvantaged by a change. For example, in a shift to fossil-free energy, that there are, there are organizations and people who see themselves as losing from that and therefore do everything they can to, uh, to impede the process. So we have a chess match. Um, what I'd like to take up here now, sociologists uh, like to talk about change processes in terms of actor and structure. And the earlier diagram of social technical systems that Sasha showed you, had people up in the left-hand corner and so several other components. What I'd like to say, coming from my bias as a social scientist is it's all about people. The technology that we need to manage a transition to fossil-free energy already exists. The technology the Swedish steel industry needs in order to produce steel without carbon emissions has been around since the late 1980s. It's the, the people, our beliefs, our systems that, that need to be changed in order to enable that. So I'd like to focus on the, on the people part about this uh, and the role that we play. And to say that there are different kinds of social structure, and I'd like to take a tour around these different social structures, uh, belief systems, cognitive models, policies and institutions, and social networks. And what's important to keep in mind is these are analytical distinctions. Each of these different kinds of structure connects with the other. So they're not, 
They're not distinct from one another, but they change in ways that are different. Um, and so let's let's start off at the top with, with uh, belief systems. That the way that we think, the way that we define the problems and the goals that we have does a lot to steer our activities, to steer uh, what we do. And in the long term, the perception of a problem uh, or a solution is, is typically what guides the kinds of goals we have and the kinds of means we use to pursue those goals. When we're successful at that, those ideas are institutionalized, moving to the next corner of the triangle. They're, they're made more solid and permanent in terms of new rules, new laws, policies, funding streams, organizational structures, that sort of thing. So for example, in the 1970s, there were very few environment ministries around the world. But as environment became better understood as a problem that needed specialized expertise, governments created separate ministries with that kind of expertise. Uh, and initially they were fairly low status ministries, but more recently they've come up in status and in some cases have been uh, very powerful in steering where governments go. So that's one example. Another is uh, starting an organization because there's a problem out there that we're not uh, grappling with. So for example, the youth organizations grappling with climate change, wanting things to move more quickly are a good example of a, an institutionalized response to, to young people's feeling that, hey, we got a problem here and we're not moving fast enough. So it's, and very often institutions are our target for change because we, we see very clearly how policies and institutions and funding streams create incentive structures, uh, sanctions for failing to follow the rules. And they, they create a kind of social order that has a little more substance than the, the way our ideas and values steer us, even though those are also very powerful. So the third in this, if we move along to the next step, are the social networks or the constellations of social actors. And anyone who's been in politics and through an election cycle realizes one of the first things you do is you look, you sort of scan the horizon and look who's out there, who, uh, who's with us already and who's out there, who's with the other guys um, and who are the persuadables in that mix. And in these kinds of change processes, we very much focus on uh, individual leaders, but also organizational uh, power, because that's really where people come together and exercise uh, power and influence. And we exercise that influence over whether new rules get adopted uh, or whether they're blocked or whether new practices can be adopted or, or blocked. And of course, that feeds back to the belief systems uh, and the way that we think, because we tend to associate with people who share not only a common set of values and assumptions, but also a common, a fairly consistent set of ideas about how the world works and what constitutes fairness and what are you know what things would look like if they were if they were better. So taking all of these into account, I want to emphasize that many of the technical changes that we're seeking are entirely possible now. It's the social element of that system uh, that is determining whether we move, how fast we move to what extent we're able to achieve those new goals. And what's really encouraging to see in that initial Mentimeter is how much the sense of justice and fairness uh, and improving the status of people's lives is a central part of that thinking about, um, about change. So let me move on to the, to the last of these structural issues. And that is uh, one that Sasha also mentioned, and that is scale. It's important to keep in mind that there are different kinds of activities that fit at different scales uh, or they, they fit best at different scales. So typically if we wanna mobilize people that happens where people live and work and exist in the physical world. So we mobilize at a local level. And even if we mobilize nationally, people are mobilizing from their homes and neighborhoods and cities uh, and through their organizations. Local level, institutions, rules, regulations have a, have a certain influence over our behavior, but we often seek change at, the, at, the, at higher scales, at the national level, 
or at the international level, for example, with the Paris Agreement uh, or at the national level. And I, I can point to a couple of interesting examples for how these levels interact. Uh, California passed uh, a, a law banning the use of single-use plastic bags a few years back. Before California passed that set of laws on a statewide basis, over 100 cities passed similar legislation at the municipal level that, that blocked those. So um, that passage of, those, of the legislation at the local level fed into the national level and enabled that to happen. Uh, and we see that kind of a pattern in the European Union, but also in the United States and other kinds of federal systems, where once you get a certain number of units at the lower scale moving past a, moving through a change process, the change at the national or, or global scale becomes more available. So just to wrap up, uh, these, what really facilitates or impairs change is the social processes that take place, the social constructions in our, in our minds, how we think about the world, the rules we set up, and the people or organizations we associate with. And if we can think through those, uh, they will enable us to play at our chess match much more skillfully and effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus, especially on uh, so focusing uh, on people as the core of all these transitions, uh, that we are doing everything for our benefit, uh, that we want to improve the quality of life of uh, our and future generation. Do you have any questions uh, for Marcus? I would like help from my colleagues. Leila Bora. Good morning, Sasha. So far, there are no questions, but I remind all of you that you can write to us at any point uh, through Q&A box or chat box. And uh, if we have any dilemmas, uh, you are more, more be welcome to ask questions. Thank you, Leila. Now we'll proceed with the next session uh, where we will discuss the future, how we can explore the future, how can we shape the future, and uh, what are the tools that enable us to have a systematic approach to this long-term planning and uh, decision-making uh, on the transitions in the present. Sara Talebian will provide answers to some of these questions. She is uh, associate uh, fellow in SAE, and uh, she is focusing on climate risks and adaptation. And uh, her, we will discuss today uh, the application of uh, uh, tools and uh, methodologies uh, which uh, help us uh, take decisions in the times of uncertainties. Thank you, Sasha, for introduction. Good morning, everyone. So as Sasha mentioned, I work with foresight methodologies and their application across a range of different topics and issue areas. And sustainable transition, of course, is one of those topics that foresight becomes very useful, very handy, if not necessary. So Sasha, talked us through the process, sustainable transition as a process. Marcus mentioned people and reminded us that it's the people who are the agents of change in their individual capacity or in their roles in different institutions and social settings. And I'm going to take us one step further and talk about tools. So what are the tools and techniques that people, us policymakers, need to push forward and accelerate sustainable transition. So I'll be discussing foresight, what foresight is as a discipline and as a toolbox and how we can use it in policy and planning for sustainable transition. So what is foresight? There is a wealth of definitions and conceptualizations of foresight dating back to 1960s or 70s, I think. Some 
narrowed down this, this narrowed down foresight to specific issue areas, like for example, technology foresight, and some broaden the concept to include a wide array of future-oriented approaches and techniques and activities. And in recent years, more broad and inclusive definitions of foresight are more commonly used. So in a generic definition, foresight is the discipline of exploring future possibilities in a structured and systematic way. It's a tool, it's a like toolbox that helps us anticipate future developments and shape the future we want. And looking across scientific conceptualizations and practical definitions by organizations like, for example, the European Commission or the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, we can see that they all associate foresight with a set of common characteristics. So if we were to summarize the key elements or components of foresight, we could say that, for, first of all, foresight involves both exploring and shaping the future. So it, of course, it helps us imagine and understand future possibilities, but it also gives us tools and techniques to influence and shape what we want to happen in future. It is a systematic approach. It involves structured processes, frameworks, methodologies, and so on. It is participatory and collaborative in nature, and it serves as a toolbox for long-term and transitional policy processes. So it enables making decisions today with effective and positive impacts long into the future. And to just very briefly touch upon the importance of foresight for long-term long -term po policy processes. I just wanted to show you this figure from a report by the European Commission. So this figure represents key challenges for the EU sustainability transition up to 2050 and beyond. And as you can see, alongside issues like threats to democracy and lack of appropriate funding, for example, Growing demand and implicitly inadequate supply of future skills and future-oriented thinking is recognized as a key challenge for sustainability transition in the EU. And there are similar examples in different con in other contexts as well. So I would say it is not far out to acknowledge that future thinking and foresight is as essential for sustainability transition as appropriate funding or as safeguarding social cohesion and trust in governments. So before we dig deep into what are foresight processes and foresight techniques, we need to remind ourselves that using foresight approaches in policy processes is not an easy task. There are at least three high level needs or prerequisites for foresight processes and their application in policy and planning. So the first of them is future thinking. It means the ability to imagine alternatives and embrace uncertainty. So policymakers at different levels of governance need the ability to think about future and embed this future thinking in their decision-making processes in order to, first of all, be able to prepare for alternative trajectories that might happen in future, but also in order to be able to make robust decisions that influence these trajectories that are coming our way in future. The second prerequisite is system thinking. So system thinking is about seeing the bigger picture. It's about the ability to explore and examine interconnections and synergies and trade-offs between different systems and different decisions that we make today. And finally, the third prerequisite, which I would say is one of the most important ones, is exponential thinking. It means the ability to observe, capture, and monitor weak signals and understand and comprehend that something that seems very small, very marginal today could become very important and very impactful in our future and for the future of our societies. So 
I think for a good example here, we could think about the history of artificial intelligence. So applied research on AI started to grow back in like mid fifties, but suddenly in the eighties, governments and private sectors totally withdrew from funding AI research because they thought that it's not gonna be a big hit anyways. And after decades, it was only after 2012, 2013, that AI suddenly became a strong signal of change with potentials to basically shift any and many aspects of our societies and economies and our livelihoods. So clearly back in the eighties, policymakers and investors were not very good at exponential thinking and foresight because they didn't see it coming while they were very weak signals for it to be a big hit. And it's just very interesting to imagine how proper funding, proper foresight and investment in AI back in the 80s could have changed the course of AI development in major ways up until now. So future thinking, system thinking and exponential thinking are all very necessary and sort of foundational to using foresight in policy processes. So now we can talk about how does a foresight process actually look like? So how can foresight in a practical way help us to navigate complex challenges like sustainability or climate change and design policies effective for future? So this figure gives us a simple but very like structured foresight process and how it might look like. So every foresight process starts with framing and scoping the issue area. Here we set out the focus, the geography we wanna work with and identify stakeholders, what needs to be addressed in a foresight process and who should be involved in it. Scanning, the next step, involves exploring signals of change and gathering and analyzing data to detect emerging trends and developments that are coming our way. The next step, futuring, as we call it, it's a little bit of funny name, but this is a common way of calling this stage among foresight specialists. So futuring is a stage where we imagine alternative futures. We generate different scenarios to understand potential future conditions, potential future changes and their implications for us. Next step is visioning. Visioning is about preferred future conditions. This involves engaging with stakeholders to understand and commit to a shared vision of a desirable future state, what we want to happen in future. And then this will follow by designing, which is about designing plans and pathways and strategies for change to achieve that desired endpoint goal or vision. And then finally acting, which involves adding details and concrete actions and measures to realize and implement those plans and strategies. And of course, foresight as a discipline has a comprehensive toolbox with methods and techniques for operationalizing every stage of such a process. So some of like the key methods that we use in a foresight process include horizon scanning, trend analysis, scenario planning, vision building. And of course, one of the most important ones is transformational planning, which is an umbrella approach for many tools and techniques for formulating resilient strategies for system-wide change. So let's see how foresight processes and techniques that we just talked about briefly can assist us in steering sustainability transitions in specific. So this illustration you see here, we usually call this the cone of future. It represents the variety of alternative futures that might happen in a time after now, whether it be five years from now or 10 years from now or 50 years from now. And as you can see, within the wide range of possible future outcomes at the base of this cone, only a few alternatives are desired futures, in our case, desired sustainable futures. 
and there are multiple pathways, multiple roads, and of course, different types of actions within each pathway that we that can help us achieve sustainability. So given this very conceptual kind of illustration, we can think about three key elements of sustainability transition. So first of all, what are sustainable futures that we wanna achieve and what do they mean for different countries, different people, different communities and economic sectors? Second is which road or which path we wanna to take to achieve those sustainable futures. And the third one is what do we need to do on the road? What actions we must take to move forward and get to that sustainable future? And now let's see how Foresight and the toolbox that we introduced could help us navigate these three aspects. So first of all is the endpoint vision, the sustainable future. So we know in a like generic definition, a sustainable future is one where the needs of the present are met without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. But there can be multiple visions of a sustainable future. Sustainable future could mean many different things for many different people and communities. This meaning, this sense making of sustainable future can be influenced by different contexts, socioeconomic and cultural backgrounds, different priorities and challenges that different social groups and communities are faced with, and many other factors. And foresight here comes to the rescue, sort of, and helps us navigate these different visions and understand their implications for different communities and different parts of the society. So for example, it can, we like we saw in the poll that justice is a very important aspect of sustainable transition for many people. In this example, foresight can assist us in understanding who benefits from a given imaginary of a sustainable future and who might be the potential loser of that process, who might be left behind and actually need more help, need, need more support to join the transition with the others. Second is the transition pathway, the road we wanna take. So achieving a sustainable transition can be approached through various pathways, each tailored to a different context, different priorities and different resources at hand. These pathways can, for example, prioritize technological innovations or policy initiatives or community engagement or behavioral change or a mix of all of these things. And foresight here can help us systematically explore these different alternative pathways and understand potential challenges and opportunities in each of them. And it can help us design just transition pathways for sustainability that foster synergies and minimize trade-offs between different systems, different sectors, and the benefits and priorities of different social groups. So for example, we can, let's imagine trade-offs between, for example, measures and policies we might make for social sustainability versus environmental sustainability. So for example, we can think that eradicating hunger sometimes means intensifying agriculture, which could then result in environmental degradation and draining resources. On the other hand, if we want to promote sustainable agriculture and contribute to environmental sustainability, this might lead to loss of some jobs and loss of likelihoods and could worsen social stability. So how do we try to manage these trade-offs and create a just and effective transition pathway Foresight can help us with different tools and different techniques that come with this Foresight toolbox. We can try to understand these interconnections between systems and try to minimize trade-offs and at the same time foster synergies between these changes in different systems. And finally, 
The third part, the third element of sustainable transition is the actions that must be implemented along the way, along the pathway. So again, these actions and measures, whether reactive to prepare for future challenges or proactive to shape future conditions, could vary based on what type of sustainable future we want to achieve or which pathway we want to take to get there. If, for example, we set course on a technology-centric transition pathway, we're going to direct investments to environmental innovations, new solutions, technological fixes for problems. But on the other hand, if we want to focus on community engagement and behavioral change towards sustainability, then we need actions and investments to go to facilitating locally-led adaptation, for example or community level resilience building or shifting diets or changing recycling patterns or consumption patterns and so on. So when it comes to that, Foresight helps us design and implement robust actions and measures that are effective and perform well given a wide variety of future possibilities. So just to like wrap up this part, I want to mention that the reality is that effective sustainable transition processes and pathways are most often context specific, as Sasha mentioned in the first session. They depend on different countries, different geographies, the world views and values and social norms and systems in any context. They are usually mixes of technological changes, socioeconomic shifts, policy transformations, and many, many other changes in other different systems. What Foresight can do for us here is to understand when we should do what in future, when in a future course of, let's say, 10 years from now, we should focus on social aspects of transition, when we should focus on investing in technological aspects of transition, and when we should, like, focus and look into justice aspects of transition. So foresight processes from framing to visioning to transformational planning are useful tools for navigating these complexities and landing a sustainable transition pathway that is appropriate for a specific country and for a specific society that we wanna focus on. And just as my final slide, I wanted to show you this example of using foresight for sustainable transition. So these are four visions or pathways for sustainable Europe in 2050. This was a project by the European Environment Agency where they used foresight processes for exploring all three elements of sustainable transition. So engaging with a range of stakeholders, they created four distinct imaginaries of the future of sustainability in Europe. They explored their implications and in doing so, they highlighted different approaches, alternative pathways and different measures and actions to achieve sustainable futures. So if you look at these four figures, each of these is a distinct scenario and a distinct associated pathway, and they highlight the different measures in each scenario. So they're saying that sustainability in Europe can be achieved by technocracy for the common good and giving all the control to state power. It can be achieved by unity in adversity, as they call it. So basically empowering the EU and EU level policies and giving control to EU level institutions. It can be achieved through decoupling from GDP growth and technological innovations for the environment. Or it can be achieved through a pathway they call ecotopia, where civil society and communities bring about a paradigm shift in collective thinking and action and different ways of consumption. And all of these pathways transition the European society away from today's status quo to reach sustainability in future, but in many different ways. And similar approaches have been used in different contexts and countries. While one size doesn't fit all and not any two sustainable transition pathways are, are similar, these existing cases 
and best practices can inform policymakers in countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina who are planning, strategizing, and trying to design a sustainable transition pathway of their own. I will stop here and thank you for listening. Over and out, back to you, Sasha. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I see that we have questions in the Q&A session. Let me read one by one. Just a second. Uh, Mirjana Radovanovic. Hello from Serbia. I'm a coordinator of the project funded by the Science Fund of the Republic of Serbia about providing key inputs for circular transition in rural areas. Very interesting event. Thank you, Mirjana. Hvala na uh, komentaru. Elvira Huskić, teško je razmišljati o održavoj budućnosti u zemljama gde je preživljavanje sadašnjosti. It is difficult to think about sustainable future in the countries where existence in the countries where um, even the present time is very hard and painful. Uh, would Marcus or Sara like to reflect maybe with one or two sentences? There's a well-known saying that uh, uh, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> that when, when things are difficult, that also increases the openings uh, to steer change toward, toward something that, that helps to address those kinds of struggles. But, but uh, uh, that's not to oversimplify the struggles of sort of national governments and countries in, in pulling people together. Um, but, uh, but I would say this idea of sustainable transitions could provide some tools for taking things in a direction that people feel like their needs are being met more substantially. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, imamo dva pitanja, povezat ću ih jer se nekako jedan, uh, jedno na drugo There are two questions, uh, they are linked to each other and they are related to resources, uh, how to prevent people from uh, using uh, unnecessarily natural resources that we have to leave for the future generation. And other question is, I think that the focus of the sustainable future for the region should be not to uh, increase pollution and preserve the environment. And how to do that is a great question. So how to prevent um, resource depletion and how to have focus of the sustainable future for the region, not to pollute the nature and keep um, the resources as much as possible. I can just briefly say that that is a, in any context in our contemporary era, that is the million dollar question. And I would say like safeguarding resources for future generations requires a lot of work, requires policy changes, requires behavioral changes, requires having more sustainable lifestyles from different communities. But above all, we need better policies. I personally think that we need better policies. We need better understanding of trade-offs and synergies between resource use in different sectors, whether it be food or water or minerals and how using these, like using the in mediating factors between these resources, or for example, how we use land for agriculture to create, to produce food versus how we use it to, I don't know, build power plants. These are issues that are more and are becoming more and more important for policy domains. And we need above all better policies for sustainable use of resources. And alongside that, we need to change our behavior, our worldviews about the planet and we need to adopt better and more sustainable lifestyles in order to safeguard resources for our future generations. Can I just Sorry, so, reinforce yeah, go ahead. what Sarah said, that better policies, those institutionalized changes are often a function of people 
um, changing their way of thinking, the kind of paradigm shift that you talked about. And I think part of the key to that is, is that uh, we need to make these resource issues more tangible than they've been. The, and that requires education, it requires sort of examples that show how, how these resource issues are, are coming up. Um, so we, we first need to change people's thinking <laughs> and we have plenty of examples to work with uh, to expand to the, the real resource uh, shortages we're facing. And then that new thinking needs to be translated both into new policies, but also doing other things that make us happy than, than the kind of consumption that, that's causing these problems. Palastare Marcus, thank you. We have three more questions, uh, but I will read two of them. And one question from Nevena, I will leave for the next panel as the first uh, question to be answered because it's directly aligned to Bosnia and Herzegovina. So question from Janetta, uh, how can foresight methods be included in spheres of policy making that integrates visions futuring by specific local communities, as well as more broadly working societal actors and administrative authorities? How to arrive at a shared vision? How do you think would be the best equipment? Who do you think would be the best equipment to host? such integrated processes of foresight to facilitate sustainable transitions. So from Janetta. I would briefly say that foresight processes in order to be best implemented need shared ownership. We need a like constellation of actors coming from public sector, the government, private sector, companies, corporations, and civil society, so non-for-profit private sectors, civil society, NGOs, and so on. And we need them to come together and share the ownership of these processes on equal basis in order to be able to engage with as diverse as possible range of stakeholders. Because I mean, it's a cheesy saying, but I'm gonna come out and say it. A sustainable future should be a sustainable future for all. And we cannot ensure a just transition to a sustainable future unless we take shared ownership in these processes and unless we engage with a wide range of stakeholders and people of interest in order to hear every single perspective about the future and in order to give voice to the voiceless and more vulnerable communities and social groups. Thank you, Sarah. Kuala. Uh, I will read two more questions and one comment, and then we will go to the session three while leaving one question for the next session because it's highly relevant for, for that one. Uh, so the question is, question, despite our efforts and planning, if indeed uh, we have to be able to be able to be do to be able to be i narušavanja obrazovnog sistema i uh, društvenog života djece. Uh, ja se izvinjavam, pobjeglo mi je pitanje. Ponekad nas to vozi, vodi u pogrešnom pravcu kako možemo uticati na ovaj proces s obzirom da je ekonomija glavni pokretački faktor. Connected a little bit to our previous webinar on megatrends. Marcus, would you like to take on this one? Yeah, I uh, I was getting the uh, the translation instead of the English as you read that out, so I heard just the last bit of that. But this is often the case when you say the economy. Who is that? What is the? We're talking about disrupting people's normal routines, and in dis in that disruption comes discomfort, um, and then in that disruption there are also winners and losers. And we need to, I think as Sarah nicely pointed out, there, for example, the losers are people who lose their livelihoods 
as a result of these changes, it's really important to, to provide support for a transition, even if that still is uncomfortable. But the economy is sort of a shorthand for saying people's material well-being. And there are, we need to explore in thinking about these, these transitions, we need to explore how to ensure that people's material well-being is maintained and improved. Uh, and that can be done while still uh, focusing on the environmental sustainability features that we need to take into account that haven't been an issue in the same way before. I hope that helps a little bit. Mark was the last question for Sara. Thank you for the interesting presentation. One question, to what extent do you think we can anticipate and or shape future using foresight tools or methods? That is a very good question. So I'm gonna try to be very brief and not very conceptual, but if you imagine the whole space of future possibilities, we can divide it into two different baskets, basically. We have a known basket and we have an unknown basket. So the unknown, the future unknown, we cannot know anything about it. And let's not kid ourselves. There are things in future that might happen. There are wild cards, black swans, uh, events with very low probability and very high impact that we cannot anticipate. We cannot see them coming. And we basically can't do anything about those. But there is at least 50% or more, I can't actually put a number on it, but a big chunk of future possibilities, we can imagine, we can anticipate them, we can see alternatives that might happen. And from that basket of known futures, you can imagine that there are two sub-baskets. One is the known future possibilities that we can do anything about, we can do something about them. And the second part or section of that basket is future events that we cannot shape or influence, but we can prepare for them. So this is a big part of the whole concept of resilience and resilience building in, for example, in preparation for climate change and extreme events in future. Climate change is happening. And even if we can limit global warming to 1.5 next year, we are still gonna see the impacts of climate change long into the future. And we cannot do anything to shape them or influence them, but we can prepare them. For example, with resilience building in infrastructure, in investing in community-led adaptation, in implementing actions and measures to, for example, facilitate loss and damage in developing countries. So that is the part of known future that we can prepare for. We can brace ourselves for their impact and we can get out of that storm better off. And of course, there is another part that there, it's the known future that we can shape, we can influence. So I would say it is not realistic to say that we can know everything about the future and we can influence our future 100%, but it is one of the most known and common future biases to be completely pessimistic about the future and say that the future is not here it's coming our way and we cannot shape it. So this is one of the common biases that people have about the future. And the first step to overcome that bias and to believe that we can shape aspects of our future, and of course we can prepare for many other aspects of future, is to try to improve future skills, future literacy in ourselves, in our communities, in our policymakers, and to try to get better at imagination. If we overcome the poverty of imagination and can actually think about alternative futures, then we can anticipate them, we can prepare them, and we can actually shape and influence at least some aspects of them. Thank you, Sarah. 
I will just read one comment from Professor Mirjana Radanovic. Erosion of education system is present, but EU somehow expects today's children to lead advanced green strategies and provide innovation in the future, which are one of the main objectives of the EU Green Deal. Confusing. I think this is a reaction to, to last Marco's comment. But thank you, everyone. Hvala svima na vašim komentarima. Imamo... Ponavljam samo još jednom pitanje od Nevene ćemo podići u narednom delu agende jer je direktno vezano... One question from Nevena will be asked in the next session because it is more relevant to the next session. So this question will have priority. Now we will transition to the last part of our event where we will discuss the challenges and barriers uh, in the application of the methods uh, that Sara mentioned uh, and the planning uh, of sustainable transitions that were addressed that was addressed by Marcus and myself what are in the broadest terms challenges in the planning uh, in futuring uh, and planning of future activities uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Three colleagues will uh, uh, be participate in the last part. Uh, my colleague Sara, whom you met, and two other panelists, Professor Dr. Mitar Perusic, who is professor at the Technology Faculty in Zvornik of the University of Istočno Sarajevo, and my colleague Sanja Navdić, who is senior coordinator of the SUTRA program in SEI, and he was uh, he was in charge of the uh, development of the environmental strategy in the pe previous period. Uh, I would kindly ask uh, Professor Perusic and uh, Mr. Avdić to introduce themselves briefly. Thank you, Sasha. Well, Sasha introduced me already. I greetings to all of you. I'm very happy to be with you today. Thank you, Mitar. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, greetings from myself. I'm honored to be a, pa a panelist uh, on this event. Uh, I have been working with the Stockholm Environment Institute for five years now. Thank you. I will kindly ask uh, Sara to uh, provide a brief introduction about the main uh, challenges and uh, barriers in the application of these uh, uh, tools, and then uh, we will give the floor to other panelists, Sara. Thank you, Sasha. So, as I mentioned in my presentation earlier, implementing foresight processes and using them for sustainable transition is not an easy task, surely. And it presents several challenges and barriers. There are many, of course, and like different barriers in different contexts and countries hold different weights and different importance compared to other challenges. But just to touch upon a few, I think we could discuss, first of all, institutional challenges and barriers to foresight processes. So organizations may resist foresight activities and processes due to their unfamiliarity with the process or skepticism about actually the fact that we can know anything about the future or we can shape anything in our future. On the top of that entrenched interest, like political interest and existing power structure can inhabit openness to diverse views and voices to be heard on what sustainable transition and a sustainable future could and should look like. And these organizations can create obstacles for long-term planning and the structural change for sustainability. There are also uh, resource constraints. So foresight activities can be quite resource intensive, requiring significant time, expertise, coordination in human resources. And of course, we know that the like, size of funding for any given project is limited and institutions in many contexts may lack the necessary capacity or financial resources to conduct comprehensive foresight activities. We could also think about contextual challenges, like for example, participation. We said that foresight is participatory and collaborative in nature, but participation and engagement is not a given, at least in many contexts. So 
engaging with a diverse range of stakeholders and ensuring that all voices are heard is not easy, can be difficult. Sometimes vulnerable groups don't want to participate in these processes because they lack trust. Sometimes private sector doesn't want to engage because they perceive financial risks or conflict of interest to their own financial stability and profit. Or in general, sometimes cultural attitudes and social norms in different contexts may resist change, particularly when foresight might suggest that significant shifts in behavior and lifestyle might be needed. And the list goes on and on. So there are political barrier, barriers, challenges with regulations and regulatory frameworks, and many, many more. So I think we. I would like to turn to you, Dr. Perushik, sorry if I'm butchering your name, and my colleague Sanyan, you both have extensive experience in running these types of activities in Bosnia and Herzegovina. What are the most important barriers or challenges to running visioning exercises, for example, or building environmental strategies in the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So with this brief introduction, I just hand it over to you. Hvala Sara. Nadam se da se čujemo. Pa evo, u kontekstu ovog izlaganja koleginice Sare, odgovorit ćemo i na pitanje koleginice. Hvala, Sara. Hvala da ćete možete da 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 uh, reflect on the question of my colleague Nevena in the context of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, when we speak about foresight, in our language, we do not only uh, speak about prediction of things, but we also speak about whether we can design the future in the way that suits us, or whether we... Generation. So the question is whether we just want to be there, just uh, observing. We want to take an active or even a proactive role in this pro process. And the answer for the majority of us present here is probably a simple answer. We all want to be active participants in shaping our future. And uh, if we want to come to a situation where we can influence uh, some events in the future, then usually in that situation, we are faced with many challenges and barriers, especially when we speak in the context of transition, about just transition and all other contexts that we want to achieve for the situation in the future. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, first of all, we are faced with uh, different problems to a slide that was uh, presented by Sara, that is a horizon scanning. Uh, that means following the current situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, whether we are speaking about the local, cantonal or state level, I have to say that we are not following the situation that closely, especially when it comes to data and information for various aspects, uh, especially when it comes to the protection of environments uh, and social aspects. The uh, situation is not followed very closely or it is only followed in, in some areas or in some specific sectors uh, and on the basis of the data that are available from some statistical agencies. And if we want to be competitive, we are not even following the situation in the region so closely. The situation in the region is not uh, so well no known to us. So we really have a lack of data regarding uh, some statistical information. Uh, and I'm speaking about different levels. Uh, a local cantonal state so we do not have all these data process in in a comprehensive way in a general when it comes to protection of environment losses of water for example or even statistical data that is relevant to the households the number of people the last census was in 2013 that was many years ago and so many things have changed 
changed in the last uh, 10 or 11 years, and we had some intensive changes. So the fact that we are lacking uh, these kind of uh, data in general, or these data are, are generated ad hoc, uh, also the sources of information are sometimes uh, questionable. So I wonder whether you receive the information that is relevant, for example, the information that you receive from the local level or from some institutions or different levels. So because of this problem of a lack of information and lack of data, it is almost impossible to follow the trends. We don't even know which kind of changes uh, have happened and whether these changes have been satisfactory or dissatisfactory. So it is impossible for us to analyze trends, for example. And if the next step is planning a scenario, then if we are lacking trends, it's so difficult for us to make some plans. Uh, it is difficult for us to make an analysis as, as experts or professionals who are dealing with system sustainable transitions. Uh, even if we make some predictions as to scenarios, we still have to be very cautious because uh, sometimes you have information, but information, but they are not necessarily conclusive information. So even if we produce any scenarios, we have to review them periodically or from time to time because uh, I think that this foresighting is a not a one-term or single-term activity. Uh, that we make some prediction once and then it is going to happen, uh, our prediction is going to come to fruition in one or another way. If we truly want to actively participate in shaping our future, then it is not a, a single activity. It has to be reviewed in the process. It's the activity that we have to constantly review as we go along. And also in that context, we also have to think about some visions. And again, I'm coming back to this root context that we do not have all available information or all data that is accessible to us. So in the process of shaping a vision for the local community or for some different level of authority, then the vision in practice can just be a wish list sometimes. Uh, very often local communities, for example, uh, local can live in some kind of illusion because sometimes uh, the vision they they will arrive to will not reflect the real situation and the situation that uh, is projected for the future. And in the end, we come to this transformative and even when you engage the best experts to come up with some ideas uh, and you have just uh, insufficient information from the ground. And even if you have a good plan, uh, I'm coming back to the point uh, that I made the last time. Uh, plan is nothing, planning is everything, because for planning, we have to allocate resources, especially from the level of local communities that have to to be very innovative in terms of fundraising, in terms of providing funds that are necessary for the processes, for resources necessary in order to implement the activities envisaged by the plan. So when you conduct all the activities related to the plan, you are not coming to the end of this cycle uh, because you have to predict uh, and make some uh, foresight for, for the future activities. And we have to review uh, uh, all this process that go along in order to see whether we have arrived at a desirable result, the result that we wanted to achieve at the beginning. And this makes the full circle 
And in the future, uh, this can lead us uh, towards uh, the future that we are planning uh, from the, the square one, square one. But it can also lead us in, uh, in some different direction or we can uh, move away from, from the traits that we want to follow. And I would not say that this is a question, a, a million dollar question. This is a, a billion dollar question because this is not a task for a single expert or a group of experts. It's a task for a broader community, even European community, uh, because there are some elements that are connected to megatrends, to global changes that we have. On the top of that, the flow of challenges that we are facing on the ground, especially us uh, who are dealing with strategic plans and with transition plans. But the outcome, uh, is usually linked to a lack of resources. And even the data that we believe are, are accurate uh, for the local level, uh, very often we see that uh, the data are not followed closely at the local level. And these are the data on which we are basing our facts and making plans, which is very often a problem in all our activities. So this was my comment I wanted to say. I don't know whether you have some questions for me. I Thank you very much, uh, Mitar. Uh, we have our colleague Sanyi Navdic as well, and uh, we would like to ask you, uh, Sanyi, to share some of your uh, experiences and, and reflect uh, about the challenges and how challenging or how easy is to work on policies that are uh, directed to the future and what are the biggest challenges in this process. Thank you very much, Sasha. It's not easy and it's not hard. I mean, for example, if we speak about Bosnia and Herzegovina and the strategic uh, uh, objectives for 2040, for example, so we have objectives that are easy. I mean, it is easy to define objectives, but uh, what is more difficult is how to achieve the objectives that you want to achieve. Of course, uh, I think that the most challenging are the first steps and establishing the priorities. On the basis of my experiences in last five years in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, with a different level of governments in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we uh, drafted the strategy. And then we also, I will also reflect on something that uh, we are working on currently with the local communities, with, uh, with the municipalities. For example, we worked on the environmental strategy for Bosnia and Herzegovina for the Federation, for the RS, and for the Bertko district. And we have reached a phase, this was a, a 10 year strategy, we've reached a phase where we have all the measures defined and uh, all these measures uh, include some five to 10 activities uh, that are spanning a several years period of time in order to reach the objective that you want to achieve. And then uh, we developed developed seven uh, sections that we covered uh, that was uh, water management, decarbonization, uh, uh, garbage, biodiversity, uh, managing of uh, sustainable resources and uh, uh, policy of environment policy. And we had 25 measures in one uh, of these sectors, and then uh, you have at least five activities uh, for each of these measures, and then we wanted to uh, establish priorities to see what is the priority in out of these seven sections that we covered, and we covered all seven sections, so we wanted to make a division uh, uh, into things that are important and things that are urgent. So our experts produce the first step and then we uh, also involved uh, different stakeholders from different level of governments and we spoke about 10 to 20 people depending on the level of government and then we wanted to 
give these results to them so we can hear their opinions. So we had this internal exercise, so to speak, in order to establish what is important and what is urgent. And eventually, if you would look at this into four phases, priorities, we saw that we have priorities which are really urgent, priorities that are important, but they can wait for, wait for a few years. And then we had priorities uh, three and four, and this is for the 10 years period of time. And in 95%, uh, it turned out that all for the second phase of priorities. So imagine all this in the terms of resources, of human resources, capacities uh, to do this, and also in terms of um, financial uh, resources and the overall number of measures at the level of BIH is 660. So you can imagine uh, if, if you have this kind of exercise because you have this one uh, pillar, we are speaking, let's say, about environment uh, strategy, you have to go through all this and talk with uh, our stakeholders, with the authorities. Uh, they told us that uh, because we are speaking about the strategy, we need to to make a comprehensive list, everything, everything from the last list. And then in the process of planning the priorities, uh, we have to look into input, input and output basis. And then uh, we have to see who is responsible uh, for which measure, uh, for the implementation of measures and once we have this established we can establish the costs and expenditures so what i'm trying to say uh, here is that it's not the issue of context or understanding sometimes it's not even the question of uh, only human resources or financial uh, uh, resources but it uh, up to the needs in a country, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, that we have so many needs that is almost impossible to implement them all. And this is the level of complexity that we are dealing with here. Uh, and establishing that the objective is the easiest uh, thing because we want to become part of the EU. So somebody produced the green agenda for the Western Balkans for us. So we know what are our obligations and we know what needs to be done in certain areas. But uh, uh, the priority is in the next three to five years, the greatest challenge that we have, the greatest challenge of all. So when, once we establish uh, these priorities for three to five years, then we can see what are, will be requirements in terms of personnel and in terms of finances. I can give you an example with, uh, with uh, local uh, levels. We have projects with four levels of local self-governance in Bosnia and Herzegovina. It's very easy to define the goals biodiverse in the area of uh, biodiversity, decarbonization, pollution, sustainable agriculture and uh, circular economy. And uh, we easily define the goals and then we did back planning, uh, divided everything in three blocks, 25, 27, 28, uh, 30, uh, medium term and uh, further long term planning again. On the uh, midterm, we it was easy to plan on short term and uh, midterm, but uh, now on, uh, in accordance uh, with the legislation applicable in the uh, Republika Srpska and the Federation, we need to define short term activities for each of these uh, uh, five areas uh, with 10 measures and uh, several uh, short-term activities each. Now, we need to sit down with the representatives of the local self-governance units and other stakeholders to define their priorities. On the one hand, uh, we have resources uh, 
uh, available to the municipality, then we have higher level of authority, which actually uh, are in charge of the uh, legislative framework for agriculture decarbonization and for policy making, of course, uh, at the entity level. And then you need to say, fine, whatever is a short term activity aiming at decarbonization on the transport or public lighting or uh, SMEs, uh, we will leave this out and we will focus on agriculture. It will be very difficult for those who work at the municipal level to be realistic. They, they are trying to be, and they are fairly realistic. But again, we may have situation that the municipalities will say, whatever we recognize as short-term activities and the short-term uh, objectives uh, for our local self-community, and uh, given the vision which we developed uh, in a participatory process, it will be difficult for anyone to say uh, which activity should be left out. So we will very likely have a max, uh, an approach which would seek to include all the activity, but uh, because of financial capacities and uh, other challenges, uh, which uh, Marcus described uh, with the uh, approach uh, bottom up, uh, and in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have uh, multiple layers of uh, government. Uh, uh, this will be highly challenging. These are the challenges that we are facing. And when we are talking about trade-offs, uh, we cannot make a cut at this point and uh, say which measures should be left out. Uh, and which should uh, remain because uh, uh, because of the lack of resources. This is not realistic. But what is a good signal from the municipalities uh, we are working with, they see 2050 as an opportunity, as a chance, and they want to pursue this path. And uh, as Professor Berisic mentioned, uh, I agree fully that this planning is a continued cycle. You cannot uh, help uh, but review from time to time what uh, should be put aside and what should uh, be further prioritized. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sanin, on these practical examples from the project uh, which we are implementing now. And they are illustrative and they open a new sphere about the barriers and challenges that have not been mentioned previously. Now, I would kindly ask all the participants to uh, put their questions into the chat box for the panelists and our colleagues. And uh, while doing this, I will have one question for the participants. Uh, I will kindly ask our colleagues from Poly uh, per event uh, to show the poll. The question is, what do you think? What are the ways to overcome challenges and opportunities for designing and implementing future-oriented uh, transformational plans and policies for sustainable transition? You may answer the question in any language, in language of your preference. Uh, while you are preparing this, I will read uh, several questions for our colleagues. Uh, follow up question for Sara. You presented what are some of the tools that can help to overcome the lack of various types of input that the professor mentioned. So, connecting a little bit your and professor's um, input, and then I will go to Elvira's after that one. I think as Dr. Perusik mentioned, uh, horizon scanning in general is this umbrella term for many different techniques and methods that we can collect data on ongoing events, like ongoing trends, ongoing situations in different issue areas and topics. It could 
involve quantitative methods like big data gathering, big data analysis, trying to collect data. For example, uh, we have this project in Brazil a few years ago about different patterns of meat consumption. And one of the solutions they used was to create a very simple, basic app for different consumers to use as they buy different types, different brands of meat from different sources. And that was for an, an example of gathering data from consumers on very local household basis. So it can also be stakeholder mapping and participatory engagement with households, with different communities, with different municipalities. And of course, participatory processes and like field work when you go there and you talk to individuals has its own risks. It's time consuming, it's money consuming, it, there are like data protection issues and so on and so on. But at the same time, even though all these challenges exist, it's like participatory engagement and co-production of knowledge is one of the most effective ways to understand what actually is happening on the local level and collect data from actual individual like human beings to understand what are their, their challenges and their priorities when it comes to sustainability and sustainable transition. But I would say the umbrella, like, toolbox for this is horizon scanning and environmental scanning. And there are many different techniques for data collection under that umbrella. Thank you, Sarah, for your answer. And uh, we have two comments. Uh, there are more comments by Elvira and Bahria. It is said that uh, when students uh, start an initiative to improve uh, environment uh, in the local community, they, uh, their intention is not understood uh, seriously. Young people uh, used to, to initiate proposals to improve in environment, uh, but they have been ignored. Uh, allegedly, we want to create future with young people, with youth, but we don't want to hear their opinion, not to mention implement their proposals. Uh, this is related to the participation of different groups. Uh, do you have any reflection or any examples where youth uh, successfully participated in such projects. I should just say um, that there was uh, one example recently in my town, a uh, small town um, in central Sweden, that they were doing visioning about the appearance of the town by 2050, the youngest generation, kids of uh, six or eight years old, they participated in the process, visioning process, and they asked very simple questions. They were asked, uh, when you grow up, what would you like to do? And uh, how would you travel, commute to work? And from very simple answers, they provided, uh, uh, they drew a very efficiently, a very solid vision, which contributed to a long-term um, thinking about uh, the improvement of uh, city transport uh, and uh, they obtained a very uh, valuable feedback uh, about culture and uh, uh, other other things uh, that uh, made us thinking that we should not focus exclusively on technology. We should not uh, disregard the human factor. Would you like to maybe jump in for the youth engagement or Sara? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I I think uh, um, one of the clear things is young people can be disruptive. It's their, you know, they question why things are the way they are, in part because they see how they could be different. And uh, we often resist those kinds of disruption because it pushes us off of our familiar paths. Uh, I, I think the interesting thing about the example with young people, six-year-olds being asked how they saw their future, is that if you have a vision for your future, you have a direction. Uh, there are steps to take. There are things that you do to sort of to, to realize that. But the other part of it is that it provides a motivation uh, because 
when you visualize something that you want, uh, it, you know, it, it channels energy. And when you have people doing that together, uh, then you also get the social element that, that, you know, that tends to feed itself that we have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of, uh, get a lot of enjoyment out of taking on challenging projects together and pursuing those. And if we're able to select out things that we can actually win, even if they're tough, uh, that provides the fuel for the next, the next time. So, you know, we need to also think in terms of a sequence of events and not trying to win everything all at once. <laughs> Thank you, Marcus, for your reflections. Let me look at the chat. Um, as far as I can see, there are no further questions or comments. Do we have anything from Facebook, Leila? No comments or questions, so we can continue. Thank you very much. Now we are entering the closing phase of this webinar. Let me come back to the poll. Uh, the, these are the results of our quiz. Uh, the political commitment is extremely important or most important according to this poll and then uh, followed by better allocation of funds and raising public awareness. And uh, a small percentage of uh, knowledge sharing and capacity strengthening, but uh, political commitment is definitely leading, uh, 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 followed by better allocation of funds and raising public awareness. These are top three ways to um, address the challenges and to implement uh, transformative plans. Uh, can we make a screenshot? Uh, with all cameras on, and we can close the event. Now I'm closing. Sam kraj, mi smo formulisali jedan set jako kratkih preporuka na koji način možemo ove alate koristiti i njih smo se u suštini dotakli što kroz naš panel sa kolegama, sa profesorom Perušićem i kolegom Avdićem. At the end, we prepared some recommendations and we already touched upon them by uh, through the presentations of our colleagues. Uh, how can we use uh, in the future? visioning this to is, facilitate uh, necessary to in Bosnia and Herzegovina? Adopt, uh, consider the possibilities for, for alternative for, futures uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, it's necessary to create about the future, roadmaps for different, different uh, policy domains, uh, activities and, uh, and measures that are of, necessary uh, in order so to reach this sustainable future. future and it is necessary to have uh, inclusion of a various uh, interested parties in order to hear their voices in this process. Uh, thank you all for your participation, our colleagues and participants as well. And uh, three most important impressions, I would not dare to call them conclusions, is that the people are, first of all, the center of our politics and our policies. And we are doing all this for the people and the better future of the uh, next generation. The plan is nothing. Planning is everything. And it is a process that cannot be completed in, in one year or two years and say that uh, we are ready for 2020. 50. And using of all these uh, tools is uh, not a single process, uh, but we need to have reviews regularly and we have to see what suits the moment in which we are operating. And we also need to have decision making process based on facts. And for this, we need both resources and data. Thank you all for participating in this 
webinar. I hope uh, it was interesting and useful to you, and I hope to see you in different uh, events that we are still to organize within our project. Uh, I would also like to inform you before we leave that you will get a link with the recordings of this webinar so you can use it, you can uh, watch it again or share it with your colleagues. And if you have some additional questions, please feel free to get in touch and to contact us after this the event you will have the link for our website in the in the presentation as well as the link to the facebook facebook page where you can follow our activities thank you and enjoy the rest of your day thank you.